Have you ever wanted to take your backyard garden to the next level without spending a fortune on chemicals that promise miracle results? Or maybe you just want to cut down on the organic waste you will to the curb every week. Either way, composting is for you. The Riverside County Department of Waste Resources has been teaching residents how to compost for over two decades. But if you can't make it to one of our classes in person, you can learn the basics right here in this video. This lesson will serve the same basic function as our standard composting class and will cover everything you need to know about composting. What materials to use, what materials to avoid, how much space you need for composting, anaerobic versus aerobic composting, compost bins versus compost piles, turning the compost, uses for finished compost, and some troubleshooting tips. As a result, this video will take a fair amount of time to work through. If you'd like to learn about a specific topic related to composting, like pile building or turning the compost, you can click on any of the links in the screen right now, and they'll take you to shorter videos about that specific topic. Likewise, if you scroll down into the description box of this video, you'll see a table of contents and a timestamp if you'd like to skip ahead to a specific section in this video. With all of that out of the way, let's begin our journey to learn how to compost. First of all, what exactly is compost? It's not mulch and it's not dirt. It's a soil amendment made of broken down organic material, packed full of nutrients that are beneficial for trees, plants, and vegetables. While finished compost looks like this, it certainly doesn't start out that way. Compost begins like this, what some might call yard waste, grass clippings and dried leaves, things that would usually go in your green bin and wheeled out to the curb. That's what compost can be made of, but there are plenty of other items that can be turned into compost as well. All of those items will fit into two categories, brown and green material. They're part of the six ingredients needed to generate compost, the other four being water, oxygen, micro and macro organism helpers, and labor. Let's take a closer look at each of those ingredients. Up first, brown materials. They can be leaves, twigs, cardboard, newspaper, napkins, paper towels, dryer lint, and sawdust. Items that are dry, high in carbon, and slow to decompose. Essentially dead materials where all the nitrogen has been depleted. One note, cardboard and newspaper are better served going into your recycle bin instead of a compost bin. But if you do choose to add cardboard to your compost, make sure it's torn into small pieces. Brown material needs to make up 50% of the compost pile by volume, not weight. In addition, for the quickest compost, brown material should be no thicker than your little finger and no longer than 6 inches in length. Then there's green material, essentially the opposite of brown material. Green material is fresh, high in nitrogen, and fast to decompose. Grass clippings, flowers, manure, food waste, and coffee grounds are all green materials. They should make up 50% of your compost in volume. The next ingredient needed is water. The pile should be as damp as a wrung out sponge. If you take a handful of compost and squeeze it, the water should barely run out. You'll actually need a bit more water when starting your compost pile, but we'll get to that in a moment. The fourth ingredient is air, which can be added by turning the compost about once a week. That's where the final ingredient, labor, comes in. Before we touch on that topic, let's talk about the pile's helpers, micro and macro organisms. Microorganisms are invisible to the naked eye, but rest assured, even though you can't see them, they're the ones responsible for turning this into this. They really are the stars of the show in composting. So without further ado, let's introduce the microscopic organisms that are tied to the temperature range of your compost pile. Psychrophilic microorganisms prefer temperatures in the 50 to 70 degree range. As those microorganisms start to eat, move around, and reproduce, they generate heat. When the pile moves to the 70 to 90 degree range, mesophilic microorganisms take over. Just like the psychrophilic microorganisms, when the temperature gets hotter than the mesophilic microorganisms prefer, they may get consumed by others, die, or move to a colder part of the pile. Mesophilic microorganisms are the workhorses of the pile. They'll be doing the lion's share of the work in an average pile. However, in the right environment, like a frequently turned pile with plenty of water, the temperature will rise. Once the pile surpasses 90 degrees, thermophilic microorganisms take over. They can survive even as the temperature climbs to 150 degrees. When the pile starts to cool down, they stay in the very center where the pile is the hottest. The goal temperature for the pile is between 130 to 140 degrees for three to four weeks. This can be achieved by turning the pile once a week. We'll teach you how to do that in a few minutes. If the temperature of the pile stays within that range for a prolonged period of time, 
85 to 90 percent of the weed and grass seeds will be destroyed, along with some pathogens. In addition to those three types of microorganisms, there are also fungi-like bacteria called actinomycetes. They have a gray, ashy look, which tricks some into thinking that their compost may have caught fire. Others report smoke rising from their pile. It's not, just steam from all that heat that's being generated. While you can't see the microorganisms in your compost, there are macroorganisms that you will be able to spot when the temperature of the pile cools to 90 or 100 degrees. They can include sow bugs, snails, springtails, worms, slugs, and green fruit beetle larvae. These macroorganisms further the decomposition process and make the compost richer. So we've told you what items to add to your compost, like brown and green materials, but there are also substances you should leave out of your compost. They include diseased plants, because it's possible the compost will not heat up enough to kill plant diseases, meaning it could spread to other plants. Similarly, poisonous plants like oleander and invasive plants like spurge should be left out of your compost. While your compost pile will heat up to kill most seeds, Bermuda grass, tumbleweeds, and spurge sometimes find a way to survive. They can then germinate wherever you spread your compost. In the end, we suggest leaving these out of compost bins because the risk may not be worth the reward. There are plenty of other green and brown materials to choose from. It's worth noting that Bermuda grass clippings, like those that have been trimmed by a lawnmower's blades, are perfectly fine to add to compost because they're shredded and don't include the roots. Bermuda grass clippings will break down quickly, while whole Bermuda roots, runners, and stolons could survive. Just make sure you know the difference between the two before adding the compost. Along those lines are succulents and other shiny-leafed plants that are high in oils like avocado and magnolia. These items have a tendency to take a long time to break down, or even root and regrow in the succulents case. For this reason, we suggest limiting the amount of these items that you put in your compost. Shredding them into smaller pieces will cut down on the time they need to break down, but they'll still take longer than other materials, so we suggest avoiding putting an abundance of them in compost. It's a similar story for plants that have thorns. They often take a very long time to decompose, which means you could be in for a painful surprise when touching compost with your hands. In addition, do not use green or brown material that was recently treated with pesticides or fungicides. They can kill the micro and macro organisms. While manure is a fine choice for compost piles, dog and cat waste should not be included. Fecal waste has pathogens that the heat produced in home composting may not be hot enough to kill. You should also avoid putting meat, fat, bones, dairy products, and oils in the compost. While all of those materials will eventually break down, the odors they emit will attract unwanted pests to your pile. So that's the long and short of what should go in your bin or pile and what should stay out. So how do we turn those materials into compost? First things first, we'll need to decide whether we want to build a compost pile or use a compost bin. There are several advantages to using a bin instead of a pile. The bin contains the compost material and keeps it from spreading out onto the ground while aiding in the heating process. In addition, there's less water loss in a bin. If you're in the market for a bin, the Department of Waste Resources has geo bins available for purchase at our Moreno Valley headquarters. The bins only cost $12 each because most of their cost is subsidized from tipping fees paid at the landfills. The bins are only available to residents of Riverside County and limited to three bins per household. The geo bin is the bin we'll use to build and turn compost in this video, so you'll get a good idea of what they're like. But you can also use other bins purchased at a store, construct your own bin using plans available on the Cow Recycle website, or opt to not use one at all and make a compost pile. Whichever option you choose, a compost bin or pile should be between 3x3x3 three by three by three feet to 5x5x5 five by five by five feet to allow for ease of turning. Anything larger can be hard to turn and time consuming, while anything smaller will not generate or maintain the heat required and will take longer to break down. Once you've decided on making a pile or bin, where do you put it? Most importantly, it has to be convenient and comfortable for you. Here in Riverside County, that will likely be in the shade. You'll also want it close to a water source or reachable by hose. Compost must have direct contact with soil, so don't put it on concrete or gravel. Lastly, choose a location that allows for a composting area that's twice the size of the bin or pile so that you can easily turn the material and work it from different angles. One more location note. It's okay to have your compost up against a fence or wall as long as the structure is not made of wood. Near a stone wall or wrought iron fence is suitable for composting, 
but a wooden fence or wall can start to break down more quickly due to the increased presence of micro and macro organisms. So to recap, the ideal checklist for the location of a compost bin or pile is away from your home, likely in the shade, near a water source or hose, on the ground and not gravel or concrete, and away from wooden fences or walls. Now that we've picked out the location, what kind of compost do we want? There are two kinds, anaerobic and aerobic, which one you choose depends on how much work you want to put in and how long you're willing to wait for finished compost. The first option for compost is the easiest, but it also takes the longest to generate finished compost. It's called anaerobic compost, but can also be called slow or cold composting. If you're building an anaerobic pile, there's not much in the way of actual building. You simply layer the material and walk away. This is the way Mother Nature composts in the forest. Leaves fall from a tree and accumulate in layers. After enough time has passed, the first layers will start to break down and decompose, forming earthy smelling humus. You can mimic this by building an anaerobic compost pile. You don't need to arrange the materials in the pile in any specific order, and you don't need to turn the compost. Because of that, the compost will not heat up, meaning it will take longer to break down. Since the compost will not reach triple digit temperatures, weed seeds in anaerobic piles will not be killed. Anaerobic compost also takes a long time to produce a finished product, six months to a year or more. Anaerobic piles can also have an odor associated with them, but there's no need to water an anaerobic pile. Simply put, anaerobic composting is the lazy man's way to compost. Just let it sit and compost will happen, slowly but surely. On the other hand, aerobic compost requires a bit more attention, but there's a much faster return, 10 to 12 weeks. To achieve compost in that time span, you'll have to layer the material in a certain manner and make sure you regularly water and turn the compost. But before we do that, we have to build it. Here's how to construct an aerobic compost pile. The goal is to have a 50-50 ratio of brown and green materials by volume, not weight. Green materials are always going to weigh more, but that's not what we're concerned with. It should be a visual representation. Half green materials, half brown materials. We're going to start off with a layer of brown material. If you have twigs or sticks, this would be the perfect place to use them. It's ideal to use them now so that more oxygen is present. Spread the layer of brown materials evenly around the bin, with the goal being to create a layer that's four to six inches high throughout the bin. Now do the exact same thing, but with a layer of green materials. Again, just like with the brown material, we're shooting for an even layer of green material spread four to six inches high around the bin. After we get that done, turn on the hose and give the whole pile a thorough soaking. Then we're going to repeat that pattern. Four to six inches of brown material, followed by four to six inches of green material, then water. Then repeat this until the bin is full to the top or you run out of materials. If you'd like to add food scraps to the pile, bury them one foot deep. It helps reduce food odor and will keep unwanted pests away. Finally, make sure you finish the compost with one final layer of brown material. The pile should start and end with brown material. The last step in making compost is adding water one more time. But this time, instead of just moistening the pile, we're going to keep going until we see water run out from the bottom of the pile or bin. Finally, securely cover the compost with cardboard, newspaper, or a piece of remnant carpet to help maintain moisture levels. Congratulations, your composting journey is officially underway. The microorganisms are getting to work. In just a few days time, you'll notice a dramatic physical change in your compost pile. Mainly, the size of the pile may shrink. In this example, we shaved off five inches in just a week. But as you can see, we don't have finished compost yet. For that to happen, you'll need to turn the pile and add oxygen and water back into the mix. How often you do this is up to you. The less frequently you turn your pile, the longer it will take to generate finished compost. Adding in new brown and green material, with the lone exception being fruit and vegetable waste, will also delay the arrival of finished compost. By turning your compost once a week, you can expect a finished product in 10 to 12 weeks. So how do we turn the compost? It's similar and a little easier than building the pile. To correctly turn your compost pile, start by removing the weight and whatever cover you're using a black plastic bag, piece of remnant carpet, cardboard, or newspaper. In our case, a black plastic bag. From there, you'll want to gently loosen the compost from the edges of the bin. 
Compost has a habit of acting like a jello mold and attaching to the sides of bins, making turning difficult. To remedy this, you can enlist the help of a second person, or in our case, a pitchfork, to help in this process. The goal is to simply pry the compost away from the sides of the bin and loosen things up for the removal. Lift the bin vertically over the pile, making sure it's completely free of compost. Once you've removed the bin, simply place it next to the compost as close as possible to make the most of the space you have. Then it's time to get to work with your pitchfork. Start with the outside edge of the compost and work inward. Transfer the material to the bin, taking time to fluff the compost with the pitchfork to break up any clumps and discourage matting. One quick note on why it's important to fluff or break up the material as you turn your compost. As we mentioned earlier, one of the six ingredients needed to make finished compost is oxygen. And it's much needed after the brown and green materials have had time to settle and break down after initially building the pile. By fluffing the material when turning the compost, there's a two-fold benefit. First, you're adding invaluable oxygen to the pile that will help speed along the composting process. And secondly, you're discouraging the materials in your bin from clumping together. This issue, commonly referred to as matting, is very common if you add grass clippings to your bin. Matted grass can have an odor, so by fluffing your compost as you turn it, you can break up matted grass, discourage odors, and keep plenty of oxygen in your pile. Now that we've addressed that, let's get back to turning our compost. We've taken our first scoop of material and fluffed it back into the bin. Is there a specific pattern we should follow? Yes. Compost that used to be on the edges should be moved to the middle, while compost in the middle should be moved to the edges. This will ensure the moisture and heat distribution in your pile is even. At this point, you don't need to worry about layering green and brown material. Everything can be mixed together because the composting process is already underway. Keep a hose handy, because every so often, every time four to six inches of material has been added, you'll want to water down the compost. Remember, we're aiming to keep things as wet as a wrung out sponge, or even a little more damp if you're turning your pile for the first few times. From there, keep repeating the process. Take a scoop of compost and fluff it into the bin, adding water as necessary, every four to six inches or so, aiming to achieve that damp as a wrung out sponge consistency. The entire process could take anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to completely turn the pile. If you want to add in new green or brown material, feel free to deposit it throughout the turning process, but know it will slow down the rate at which you generate finished compost. Once all of the compost has been moved back into the bin, there are two final steps. First, turn the hose back on and give the entire pile one last soak. After that's been completed, return the cover and wait to the top of the bin. Voila! If you've been turning your compost, you may run into a few problems. Odors, heating issues, or pests. All of which are easily fixable. If your pile has an ammonia odor, it's likely because you have too much green material. To remedy this, just add in more brown material. Even something like newspaper can be enough to remedy the situation. You just want something to achieve that 50-50 ratio of browns to greens. If your pile has a sulfur or putrid smell, it's a sign that your pile has too much water. You can choose to disassemble your pile and let it air out, but if you'd rather keep everything together, adding in some brown material to soak up the water is another option. If the thermometer isn't moving in your pile, there are a few reasons why compost won't heat up. Most often it's because your pile is too small. Ideally, your compost will be at least 3 by 3 by 3 feet. You may have to hold off on composting until you can amass that much material. Sometimes neighbors can come in handy in this situation. Other reasons for piles not heating up is that it's too dry or doesn't have enough green material or water. Remember, your compost should be as damp as a wrung out sponge and should have a 50-50 ratio of brown and green materials by volume, not weight. The last bit of troubleshooting deals with pests. If animals are getting into your compost, having some sort of cover, a plastic bag or piece of remnant carpet, and weighing it down with a rock or brick is a great way to keep stray animals out. If you're getting flies in your pile, it's a sign that you're not burying food scraps deep enough in the compost. Remember, you want to dig down at least one foot to bury food scraps. If you're getting ants in your pile, it's a sign that you may need to water or turn your pile a bit more frequently. Ants don't like getting their home disturbed or drenched and will often relocate. One other reason for being visited by animals and pests is having forbidden items in your compost. Meats, cheeses, and oils give off odors that attract unwanted visitors. Food scraps should only be limited to the items we mentioned earlier in the video. Those are all solutions to common composting problems, but if this troubleshooting guide didn't solve your particular issue, or if there's something going on with your compost that you're stumped by, 
we're more than happy to help. Call our office at 951-486-3200 and we'll work through it with you over the phone. If you've been diligently turning your compost pile, it will eventually turn from this to this. How do you know when your compost is truly finished compost? It should appear dark, crumbly like chocolate cake, smell like fresh, damp earth, and look nothing like the material you started with. What began with a full bin of brown and green material is now just a half or third of finished product. You should have enough to cover a six foot square area three to four inches deep with compost. You can run the finished compost through a screen to sift it into fine particles. Branches and other items that didn't quite break down can be added to a new batch of compost. Compost in the soil provides natural nutrients to plant roots, helps to hold moisture through periods of drought, and helps to create healthier soil to aid plants in fighting diseases. Now that the fruits of your labor and the labor of the microorganisms is paid off, how can you utilize compost in your yard? Compost is a fantastic soil amendment packed with nutrients that support plants, but compost isn't like the bright colored fertilizers you find lining the aisles of big box stores. Those products will have higher numbers of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, also known as NPK. The NPK of many commercial fertilizers can be 10, 10, 10 or higher, while compost can be lower than 1, 1, 1 in some cases. But the advantages of compost can last much longer than commercial fertilizer, as the water saving and nutrient benefits can be seen for up to a year. As the saying goes, compost feeds the soil, while fertilizer only feeds the plant. So let's put that compost to good use. Soil incorporation is likely the option that gives you the most bang for your buck, since all those brown and green materials will break down into just a few precious shovelfuls of compost. With soil incorporation, you simply take a shovelful of compost and dig it into the existing soil about six to eight inches deep. Mulching is another way to use compost. To mulch, you simply place compost on top of the ground, being sure to keep it away from stems and trunks. Ideally, you should layer the compost two to four inches deep. Compost tea is a great way to use the nutrients that compost is packed with. Compost tea is a soil amendment made by steeping finished compost in a bucket of water for a day. Simply take an old pillowcase and fill it with a few scoops of compost. Tie the pillowcase and submerge it in a bucket of water like a proverbial tea bag. After 24 hours of soaking, you'll be able to use the nutrient-packed tea on everything from vegetables to houseplants. There's other forms of composting that you can use to enrich your soil, like grass cycling. That's when you remove the bag from your lawnmower and cut only the top third of the blades of grass. The freshly trimmed grass pieces will fall into the lawn and provide a valuable nitrogen source as they break down. There's also something called post hole composting. That's when you dig a small hole in the ground 12 to 18 inches deep and bury fruit and vegetable scraps. Fill the hole back up with dirt and eventually the material will break down into a nutrient rich soil amendment. Finally, there's vermicomposting, which uses a bin containing red wiggler worms to break down fruit and vegetable scraps, coffee grounds, and more. This is a great option if you live in an apartment or condo and don't have the space to compost. So that's it, the start to finish about composting, where the finished product is a lot different than the materials at the start. With everything we've learned about composting, it's only fair to show off some of the rewards you can reap by using soil amendments in your garden. It's not just micro and macro organisms that love compost, it's fruits and vegetables too. The proof about the benefits of compost are on full display here. It's a great reminder about what compost can do, and it's a little extra incentive to remember when turning the compost becomes a bit of a chore. It's all worth it in the end, because compost turns trash into treasure. For more information on composting, including a free schedule of dates and locations of our composting classes, or any other of the free services the Riverside County Department of Waste Resources offers, visit our website or call our office at 951-486-3200. Thank you for being a part of the solution and managing waste for a better tomorrow.